Morning, folks. I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School. Back down here at the Pathfinder Outdoor Classroom on a nice, chilly, 29 degree morning. What I want to do today is I made a video the other day. It was a response kind of to something to do with the 10 C's, and we talked a little bit about some of those 10 C's and why I think they're effective. Yada yada. But we talked about the five B's of first aid in that video, and a lot of people were like, "Well." How, you've ever done a video on that? And I thought somewhere along the line I had done a video on this whole five B's of self-aid or first aid concept, but I couldn't find it myself on my channel either. So I thought I would go ahead and reiterate that today with you guys a little bit and talk about not only the 10 C's and how they address these five B's, I also want to introduce you to the concept of the five H's, which I call more life threats that you need to be aware of in a wilderness environment as well. This is not a wilderness first aid type class, okay, that I'm giving you on this video. We are a certified Red Cross training facility out here at the Pathfinder School. We have not only EpiPens on site, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but we also have an AED on site here at the Pathfinder School because student safety is our largest concern. A cohesive, good work environment for learning and student safety are our two biggest concerns out here at the Pathfinder School. So we take self-aid and first aid very seriously here. I don't want to attempt to teach any of that to you on video. I think the learning experience for that should be here at the school. And we do offer Wilderness First Aid and CPR courses a couple times a year here at the school that you're welcome to sign up for that go way beyond anything that you could take online as far as a Wilderness First Aid certification type course goes, where you take so much of it online and you go and demonstrate a few skills, do patient assessment. We do way above and beyond that with actual scenarios out here at the school actual extraction of you know a patient to a location where he can be picked up by an ambulance things like that we do lots and lots of patient assessments lots and lots of different injuries lots and lots of different treatments and things like that in the field using your kit using first aid supplies all those things we do here at the school i would encourage you to sign up for a course if you're going to be outdoors recreating often that's something that i tell people all the time is one of the first things you want to learn is how to take care of yourself your family members or a buddy, or even your pet for that matter, if you're recreating a lot outdoors with those people or by yourself. So what I wanna talk about today is just give you kind of a, another springboard, if you will, of how to look at these things and ways to look at them and explain some of my theory behind how these 10 C's can help you address some of the more common things that can happen to you, as well as some things that may be more life-threatening in a wilderness environment. So let's start off with a review real quick of these 10 C's, all right? Again, most of this stuff has a first letter that it starts with, and the words are kind of jumbled in there so that it's easy to remember. So bear that in mind as we go through this, that there's a reason I've used that word in that location so it's easy to remember and relates to that type of equipment or that type of issue. So we have cutting tools, cover elements, combustion devices, containers, cordages, cotton material, a compass, candling device, headlamp, flashlight, whatever you choose, cargo tape, duct tape, 100 mile an hour tape, whatever you want to call it, heavy duty adhesive tape, and a cloth sail needle, which is used for punching holes in tent canvas. Can also be used on leather and things like that. The very heavy gauge needle. You can get them in different sizes. So whatever works best for you is what you should get. But they are an important item in this system because they will assist you with a lot of things that come into self-aid as well as repair. And that's really kind of where these second five C's fall into place is. They, the first five C's are kind of that emergency, I gotta have this. The next five are kind of like, these are going to help me with navigation, signaling, repair, self-aid. These are going to help me with some of the things that I may need along that way during that 72-hour scenario or to get me out or get me rescued. So we'll talk about that a little bit along the way because I want to relate these things back and forth. And I'll try to get some close-ups of this stuff for you information-wise so you can see it better on your screen. Now, the five B's of self-aid are really five most common things that can happen to you in a wilderness environment. And those are the things that you need to understand how to address from a self-aid or first aid standpoint. So the first one we have is bleeding. The second one is break sprains and strains. The third one is burns. The fourth one is blisters. And the fifth one is bites and stings. 
and some of those are more encompassing than others. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Then you have basic the five H's that are more life-threatening depending on the severity. And those are hemorrhaging, which goes back to bleeding, dehydration. Now I've got hydration and then in parentheses D for dehydration. Hyperthermia and hypothermia, getting too hot, getting too cold. And then hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis, which is an allergic reaction to something. And that can be one of the biggest life threats. And there's not a lot you can do for that from a first aid or self-aid standpoint, unless you have an EpiPen with you. And we do have those here at the school. We carry them when we go out with students in our first aid kits. I have a paramedic. I have an EMT here on staff. We have plenty of people to take care of those things. But you have to have a prescription for an EpiPen. And you should have one of those if you know you have an allergic reaction to things like bees, shellfish, peanuts. <coughs> those are the most common things. If you have an allergic reaction to a snake bite, you're not going to realize that that's going to happen until it happens. So you're probably not going to be prepared for that. But some things that you have allergic to or that you have allergens to, to begin with, you can be prepared for. Just like you would carry a tourniquet, possibly, you could carry an EpiPen. My wife, Iris, has problems with bee stings. So we carry an EpiPen with us everywhere we go, even when we go overseas, to make sure that she's taken care of. So <clears throat> that breaks it down into categories so that we can start to kind of look at these things. Again, not from a, this is first aid or self-aid information that I'm teaching you and you can just take this to the bank. And I don't want to put that out there on video. What I want you to do is I want you to use the thought process that I'm giving you. And I want you to go get training yourself so that you understand how this stuff relates and you'll be better prepared if you're outdoors. So let me get a couple close-ups of this real quick for you on camera and then we'll move on. Okay, real quick. We talked about yesterday in the video or the day before, whenever it was I shot that video, about the rat tourniquet that I carry in my pocket all the time. That's because it's convenient, easy, small. It's not bulky, it's not pointy, it's sticky or nothing like that. I can stick it in my pocket and I don't even know it's there, all right? But in my backpack at the school, I have a cat tourniquet. So I have both. The fact of the matter is there are some situations that a cat tourniquet even though research says it's the best tourniquet to use, doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best. When it comes to small children or animals, a rat tourniquet is much more effective. And remember that this whole carrying a tourniquet into the woods thing is a fairly new concept when it comes to bushcraft, woodcraft, survival, and prepping and all of those types of things because most people take a lot of their survival information from old military manuals and all of them talked about improvised tourniquets. And improvised tourniquets have a fairly high percentage success rate sometimes in some studies that I've read, depending on how they're applied and the knowledge you have going into the scenario of how to do it. And that's what's really important is that you understand and practice these things so that it's not the first time you have to do it is when you have to do it. It's like the Bodril fire. You don't go into an emergency scenario and hope you're going to start a Bodril fire and you've never done it before because your chances are very slim of doing it right the first time. And when it comes to bleeding, you only have one chance. It's not like a fire where you may have multiple opportunities. So <clears throat> if you wanna carry multiple tourniquets, that's fine. <clears throat> Again, when I'm by myself, I carry a rat tourniquet every single day in my pocket, and that's good enough for me. And I very rarely carry anything beyond that for first aid kit in my backpack by myself, or when I'm out with my dog, things like that. If I'm out with a group or if I'm out with students, then I have a first aid kit dedicated on my pack. And I either have a small one, this size that's inside a pack, or I have the one on the outside of my Pathfinder Scout pack. And both of them have things in them like quick clot, like bandages and gauze and things that you can wrap stuff with for bleeding. They don't have a bunch of band-aids and things like that in them. They're more bleed stop kits. But I also have an EpiPen in that kit. And when I'm with my wife, I always have one in my bag. And if you're allergic to something, you should have one with you. 
You should understand that if you need heart medication, you should have two to three days of that in your emergency kit. If you are diabetic, you should have two or three days of whatever you need. The other thing to think about is, do you have asthma? If you're asthmatic and you have an albuterol inhaler, you better have a brand new one in your kit somewhere for an emergency. My wife is asthmatic, so she has an albuterol inhaler with her all the time. But whenever we go overseas or we travel, I make sure that she has at least two brand new ones with her all the time before we ever get on a plane or ever leave the United States. And when we travel, we make sure that she has one and availability to get a prescription filled somewhere for another one if needs be. But if you're going to travel out into the wilderness environment, you need to have a brand new albuterol inhaler with you at all times if you are asthmatic. So those type things go above and beyond this 10 C's again, which is a springboard. If you know you have to have something, obviously you better be carrying it. Now, the tourniquet, again, that's kind of an on-you thing. It is part of the 10 C's concept, which we discussed in that video, because it is cordage in and of itself. And you can use an improvised tourniquet from pieces and parts of this 10 C's kit as well. But if you choose to carry one, make sure that you understand how to use it and make sure that you understand how to make it effective when you need it. Now, off that subject, let's go back to this list and kind of look and see how it relates to these 10 C's and some of the components within these 10 C's. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit as we go. So let's first look at bleeding, all right? We talked about bleeding until it's a dead horse now, okay? Bleeding, obviously, if you go down here to, you know, your cordage, that's going to be your tourniquet or some type of improvised tourniquet. Also, your cotton material for bleeding, depending on the severity of the bleeding. Those things will all help you take care of that. And then you also have cargo tape, which you can use to secure bandaging and things like that to help you cover a bleeding wound or stop bleeding, to put on a pressure dressing, things like that. So you have things to address bleeding within that kit. You also have a container in that kit that you can use to irrigate a wound, to get the debris and things like that out of a wound if you need to. You have a cloth sail needle that you can use to be able to remove debris that you can't necessarily get to easily. If you have an SAK, you have a pair of tweezers. If your SAK is part of your cutting tools, you have a pair of tweezers that you can take care of that with as well. And when I go to bleeding here, I'm talking about wound care in general sometimes, not just profuse bleeding that's going to kill you, okay? Break sprains and strains. Isolation, big, ugly, firm, and fluffy. Those are the things we think about when we talk about brakes and sprains and strains. So when it comes to brakes, obviously you wanna immobilize that brake. So we have our cover elements that we can use to wrap things with that are padded. We have a container that we can use for a cold pack or a hot pack for swelling, things like that. We have cordage that we can use to tie splinting and things like that on from the landscape. We have cotton material that we can also use as part of that wrapping and tying. If we're using a shamag or a piece of a cotton t-shirt as a binding, we can do the same thing with that. Um, and I'm probably gonna miss some things here as I go. I'm just kind of whipping through it real quick for you guys so you understand. Um, the other thing that you wanna think about with like sprains and strains, a sprained ankle, the cotton material that you're carrying really can dictate how efficiently you can address that sometimes because you think about a sprained ankle, most of the time you wrap that with an elastic bandage, like an ACE bandage. And a cotton shamog doesn't really have a lot of stretch to it. So if you wrap that thing very tightly around a swollen ankle to stabilize things, you may end up creating a tourniquet before it's over with as it swells. If you have a cotton t-shirt, cotton t-shirts are very stretchy. So you can take that thing, you can cut the bottom out of it, you know, about like this, split that in half, and then you have a piece of ACE bandaging about, you know, this long, and you can make two or three of those if you need to. So you have ways that you can wrap a sprain or a strain without so much constriction that doesn't allow swelling without cutting off blood circulation. And that's important to understand that as well. Uh, burns, okay? Burns depends on whether it's first, second, or third degree. I don't want to get into that too much because I'm not trying to give you medical information or advice in this video. But what I will tell you is some burns, you want to keep them wet. Some burns you want to wrap with dry material. You have, obviously you have your cotton material for these things. You obviously have um, 
a container that you can make things wet with if you need to. If you need water on the fly, you have a container for that. And we'll, all right, so we definitely can address burns and things like that. Again, I would urge you to take a first aid course. I would urge you to understand how to do these things. I'm just kind of relating how these things relate to the 10 C's for you right now, okay? Blisters, we have, all right, blisters, we have cargo tape. So we have something that we can create a moleskin type covering with by layering the tape and cutting a donut in if we need to. We also have our claw sail needle that we can puncture a hole in the edge of that blister to drain it if we need to. We have cordage with us that we can use to create a wick if we want to, to wick fluid away from that blister by passing it completely through the blister and leaving like the inner strand of paracord in there to wick away so that the blister doesn't raise up again. We have things that we can use for padding. If we just get an area that's about to blister, we've just got a friction area. Then we've got our cotton material for that, that we can use along with our cargo tape that we can use to create something that will alleviate that friction. When it comes to bites and stings, go back to that cutting tool again. We have something that we can get those things out with to include ticks and things like that. Stingers that may be in there. I would include pokes and pricks and that splinters and things like that. All of those things can be addressed with a pair of tweezers or a sail needle fairly easily. And then you can cover that wound the same way you do with everything else. Um, obviously you have something that you can irrigate the wound with if it's an actual animal bite of some kind. You can irrigate that wound obviously with your container if you need to. And then you have plenty of bandaging material to cover that up with, with your cotton material and your cargo tape. So if you look at these five things, you know, pretty much we've related them all here. And if you look at this, we've got the compass we haven't talked about too much, but it gives you a mirror to see things you might not be able to see or on your face if you get an injury that you might not be able to see. So it gives you an inspection device on your compass. You also have things like combustion that we didn't talk about, which enables you to sterilize things like a sail needle or a pair of tweezers that you're going to use in an open wound. So you're going to use every one of these things, including possibly a candling device, if something happens to you at night so that you can see what you're doing. You're gonna use one of those 10 C's or multiple of those 10 C's to address all of these main five B's of self-aid. <clears throat> and one more thing we should talk about before we move down to these life threats or these five H's is we should understand that if we're talking about a scenario where there's more than just, I got hurt and I'm gonna be out there, you know, a few hours and I'll be home. If you're talking about a two or three day scenario, the ability to have a fire and the ability to have a container to be able to boil water to disinfect or clean bandaging material to redress a wound can be important as well. So what you're seeing here is that all of these 10 C's become part of your first aid or self aid kit. You just have to understand how to utilize them in that scenario. Now, let's drop down to these life threats. Hemorrhaging, we really already talked about it as much as we could, okay? It goes right back up to this whole bleeding thing to the tourniquet and things like that, okay? Hydration is something that you need to pay attention to because you can become dehydrated that can affect your performance and affect your situation long before you become hyperthermic. Even though hyperthermia is a result generally of dehydration, before you get to that point, you can still address the hydration factor to mitigate that situation from happening to begin with. So hydration is a very important thing to understand and becoming dehydrated is something you never want to do. Do we have the means to take care of that in our kit? Of course we do. We have fire so that we can disinfect groundwater resources if we need to. And we also have a container that we can boil water in if we have to. And that's really the importance of that stainless steel metal container. Yes, you can carry multiple containers that will hold water whether it's a dry bag, a two quart canteen, a camel back, which I hate, but whatever you choose to carry, as long as you've got that metal water bottle to use for disinfection of groundwater resources, don't rely on other methods unless you absolutely have to. Yes, you can carry a grail. Yes, you can carry a Sawyer. Yes, you can carry iodine. You can carry chlorine tabs. Whatever you want to carry is fine, 
But if I can boil the water, I'm going to do that first. If I can't, then I will choose the other things. And if I can't do anything, I'm dang sure gonna drink the water before I'm going to become dehydrated. Never sit by a water source that you're afraid to drink and become dehydrated and then eventually succumb to something like hyperthermia because you refuse to drink water, okay? Most of the things that are going to affect you in that water are going to take some time, hours, before they're going to affect you anyway. And it's quite possible that you could be rescued or affect self-rescue before that time comes. So if you're at a water source that you have no way to disinfect, don't dehydrate because of that. That's, I guess that's my advice. And again, I'm not trying to give you medical advice. I'm just telling you my opinion, all right? Your opinion and what you do is what you're comfortable with doing. All right, so hydration, we've covered that. We've got combustion and we've got container to take care of that with, okay? Hyperthermia, hypothermia, getting too hot, too cold. Again, we have a shelter situation here. So both of these, we have our cover elements that we can help control those things with. We can create shade, we can create a heat reflector, we can wrap things around our body, we also have combustion to where we can start fire if we need to in a hypothermic situation to help control our body core temperature. We also have containers that we can heat water in to affect rewarming from the inside if we need to in that situation or to be able to give water in a hypothermic situation as needed. All right, so we have plenty of things in our kit that we can address these life threats with as well. All we need is the knowledge of how to proceed. And that comes from training, okay? Hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis, that's probably the one life threat that there's not a whole lot you can do about with what you have with you because this thing right here, this EpiPen, is probably the only thing that's going to help you depending on the severity of the attack, okay? Again, with hypersensitivity, unless it's to something unknown to you, beforehand, maybe you didn't know you were allergic to shellfish and you ate some crayfish or something like that. And all of a sudden you become anaphylactic. Well, you didn't know that was going to happen. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do about that other than get medical attention as fast as possible. Lay the person down. Don't allow them to drink. Don't let them vomit on themselves. You know, keep them covered and comfortable. There's not a whole lot you can do about that. Apply, you know, give CPR if in the event that they would stop breathing again training 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 but that's the one thing that you really don't have a lot of control over along with things like heart attacks and things like that which again you know those are unforeseen things that can happen and they don't happen very often but they can happen these are the most common things you know you could have any type of an acute attack in a water situation that may not fall into one of these categories but it's not something that's as common as other things. So these are the most common things. There's lots and lots of people that have allergies out there to something that know what those allergies are going in. So being able to take care of that or avoid those things or address them if needs be is what's important. So again, this video in no way, shape or form is giving medical advice. What this video is telling you is ways that these 10 C's relate to common issues that you may have to address in a self-aid or first aid type environment. I'm telling you that you should take training, that you should get certified in wilderness first aid, if not wilderness first responder and definitely CPR. We do have wilderness first aid CPR class here at the school. We are Red Cross training facility certified here. We have all the things to teach CPR here, including a live AED that we can let you look at and understand how it works. But we have training AEDs as well that you used to train with during your CPR training. And we have a staff of people here that include an EMT and a paramedic to teach these things so that you know you're getting good, sound medical advice. So that's what I would encourage you to do. This, again, springboard, right? This is a baseline to let you know that, hey, I'm carrying this stuff. And there's a reason that Dave doesn't harp on IFACs all the time, all right? I don't harp on IFACs. I never have because I've always believed that this big one right here, this bleeding, is the biggest thing that I have to worry about. And if I can take care of that, you know, everything else 
can be done fairly well with what I have on me. And I don't need a lot of special stuff to take care of that in the interim of getting good sound medical attention. That's my point with this video. Guys, listen, I didn't want to drag this out too long and I didn't want to over explain things, but I didn't want to really under explain things either. There's going to be some people that will argue with some of this, I'm sure. There may be some things I missed, I'm sure. Again, it's just a baseline, so take it for what it is. I appreciate your support. I appreciate your views. I appreciate everything you do for our school, for our family, and for our business. All of our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends. I hope you guys have a fantastic holiday. In case I don't get a chance to shoot another video between now and then, but I'm sure I will. But I just want to get it out there now that I wish you guys all a very happy holiday. Merry Christmas. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I appreciate everything that you do for us. And I'll get back here with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.